whoa, 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 whoa. Easy, easy, Doyle. Calm down. OK. Show me who it is. Tall adult male, built for running, bristly hair, like a hedge beast. Face is kind, but his eyes are so sharp. Oh, I usually get on well with dogs. He's a stranger, Callan. Hardly surprising, mate. Only just quite here. I'm the doctor, by the way. Doctor? You're from off-world? That's right. Parked up in the woods. Been walking all afternoon. Didn't see a single other person. You two live here alone? Well, no one lives here now. We're on a recce. It's OK, Doyle. He's friendly. If you say so. Spectacular sunset, though. White clouds on a burgundy sky, like raspberry ripple. They always like that. Yeah. I believe so. Oh, I see. I don't. Not everything. I've partial sight. Close details, some colours. Faces... That's more difficult. Got it. So Doyle's your... He's my best friend. You don't need to feel sorry. Why would I feel sorry? You're clearly doing fine. We do all right. Don't we, Doyle? You're my best boy, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. We're a team. That was a clip from Big Finish's Doctor Who Red Darkness, starring Christopher Eccleston, Harky Bambra, and Adam Martin. And I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Adam now. How are you doing, Adam? Hello, yes. Uh, thank you for having me on the Mr. Tardis channel. And I'm, I'm doing well, thank you. I'm doing really well. Uh, great stuff. I appreciate um, your time because I know you've been uh, busy with many other projects and your own YouTube channel as well. So no, I, I appreciate you being here so much. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Yeah, so uh, we'll talk about uh, Red Darkness uh, uh, in a moment, but the box set has been out for a couple of days um, and, you know, you've been keeping this from the whole community, from me to you. <laughs> you kept it from my face when we last met up a few months back. I know, uh, I know, and I'm sorry. <laughs> so, but, so how are you feeling now that it's like making its way through the ears of the community? It's. It, I'm so glad that it's now finally out for the community to hear, as you say, because I recorded this back in November 2021. So we're talking well over a year ago. Mm. And I guess I found out in September 21. So it's been near basically a year and a half. And, um, you know, I think we all know with Doctor Who, people have to keep things under wraps for a long time. Mm. I don't think at first I was prepared for just how long I'd have to keep it under wraps because knowing that, you know, you can see the pre-orders and like roughly when things are coming out. Mm. So I was like, oh, gee, I wonder when this one's got. And then I saw and I thought, oh, OK, that's a long time away. But um, I think the hardest part was the first month. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. when you find out, because with something like that, you just want to tell everyone. But of course, I couldn't. Um, as time went on, it got easier in the sense that not that I forgot, but, you know, you just sort of put it to the back of your mind mm. then and it's like whenever the time comes and then yeah when big finish when i got the email saying this is when you can talk about it it was it was exciting but also really nerve-wracking because uh, you know you don't know how as an actor in any project you don't know how people are going to react to it mm. um but um i've been very lucky i've had a lot of really lovely comments from various people so if you were one of them any listeners uh, thank you so much it's it's really lovely it's really lovely to hear yeah but you could have had so much clout on Twitter, nah. couldn't you? Or oh, on Reddit, <laughs> one of those leakers. Le <laughs> yeah. But if, you know, clout versus never working for Big Finish potentially again, <laughs> yeah. you know, it was a it was a fairly easy choice. But I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I'm sure there are it's like yeah, like you say, it's the people like uh, who the people who work on the T V show who are the mysterious leakers, as you mm. say. It's all for the clout. But no, it was uh it was it was difficult, but we did it. We managed it. Yeah, and, and Red Darkness, uh, like, not to try and um, overstate it or anything, but it's one hell of an opening for your like your big finished Doctor Who debut. It's a ninth Doctor story, fan favourite. It's essentially yeah. the second series finale. Uh, right? yeah. Roy Gill, <laughs> terrific writer. He's done a great job with this and the other finale as well. He, he was great at whatever he does, really. And it's got the Vashta yeah. Narada in it. I know, so, like, I know. So you, you, you've already done a video on your own channel, uh, AMTV, yes. uh, AMTV Who, because uh, you've branched mm. off um, as well. Yes, so yeah, uh, yeah. talking briefly about how you got on board with the project, but like, what was it like receiving that email and like that story pitch from uh, from Helen Goldwyn, who's uh, the director of the set? It was crazy. I mean, it was actually uh, it was a it was a phone call. Um, wow. I got a phone call in September. Yeah, September twenty twenty one. I was actually on my way to work. Um, and it was Helen, you know, and I hadn't heard from her since I think I interviewed her, which was in the January. So you know, it had been about half a year. And, you know, you do the usual, oh, you know, how you doing? Is there, you know, are you well? Is everyone okay? Blah, blah, blah. 
And uh, she said, so I'm calling because um, I, I have this script and I need someone to fill this part. And I remember you said you were partially sighted and the character has visual impairment. So, you know, would you be up for recording it? And, you know, I was like, yeah, of course. I would. You know, a chance to be in a, a Doctor Who big finish, of course. And then she said, oh, and it's with the ninth Doctor. And that was just <laughs> like, oh, my God. I mean, you know, you know, a lot of our generation, uh, you know, got into Doctor Who through Christopher Eccleston and that revival. So... The, the sheer thought of like I'm going to be working with this man, it was was crazy. And then I had to go to work. Mm. <laughs> and I had to, and every, I, I remember one or two people actually said, "Oh, you're very like cheery today." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, I'm just having a good day, you know. It's just been a good day." But um, no, so yeah, having that phone call completely out of the blue. It was not, you know, there was no sort of like master plan to it or anything like that. It was completely out of the blue. And uh, I always say, you know, if Helen's listening, thank you so much again, Helen, for thinking of us and getting us involved. But yeah, and, and the story, I mean, when I got the script sent through, uh, like you said, saw Roy Gill's name, thought this is going to be good because, <laughs> as you say, he's a phenomenal writer. He's written so many great scripts for Big Finish over the years, hasn't he? And um, I did notice it said, you know, series two box set 4.3 <laughs> so i thought oh no it's the finale i've got to do the finale um but then like you said as i read through it reading that the vashton arado are in it i mean that's just they're such a cool concept for a villain anyway and i, I don't know what you think about this but i think on audio they're debatably even creepier than mm. they are on television that's what i think anyway yeah I, th I think it's easy a bit like the weeping angels it might be easy to just rely on yeah like the sound effects that the yeah. fandom like associate with the weeping angels like you know the jump scare moment or maybe the sound of like skeletons or bones crunching or something but it's it's, yeah, it's yeah. just also a genuine genuinely creepy story as well um it like is. i think um i forget his name the actor who plays bram um yeah early on like, he does a terrific job with that um mm. but before we get too far ahead with uh, the specifics on the story uh, let's talk about red darkness proper like uh, talk to yeah. us about the character of callan callan lennox yeah, so Callan, he's a, he's a young man. I'd say he's on the older side of his teens, you know, like getting towards adulthood. But as, as we all know from go, from being teenagers, it's a, it's not the easiest time, generally. Mm. There's a lot of there's a lot of change going on in like who you are, your personality and stuff. And added on top of that, obviously, Callan has a visual impairment. His macular degeneration starts from the, the center of his eye. So his vision's not, you know, as it should be for a, a normal teenage lad. Um, and being visually impaired myself, and I always make clear my visual impairment is not exactly, it's not the same as Callan's, mm. it's different, but I could say both characters, well, but characters, Callan and myself, going through teenage life, you know, there are certain things that you know you can do or want to try yourself, but people, people, I know it's good intentions, but you know, people feel like they have to overhelp in a way. And when you're growing up, it sort of makes you, or it can make you feel like you can't really do anything for yourself when you actually can. So I think seeing that in the Doctor, the Doctor doesn't, you know, sort of molly coddle, uh, you know, Callan in the same way that others might. So I think he has a lot of admiration for him, and he's got Doyle, his best mate, <laughs> is a uh, is is dog, who of course can talk because we're in the wonderful world of of Doctor Who. And um, I just I love the even reading it, I love the rapport Callan and Doyle had. Mm. They're just because they are just two mates, you know, even though it's a human and a dog. I I think, and I hope it comes across on the audio that it, it is just two mates going through life bantering with each other but they also look out for each other as well you know they might tease each other but when when the serious bits come you know they've got each other's back all the way so mm. yeah it, it's weird in some ways he's like any other teenage lad but in some ways he's different partly because of the disability he has but also just how he approaches life in general yeah i think um, there's a great relationship between callan and doyle they're basically one character in and of themselves the pairing yeah that's, that's the impression i yeah. got and when we meet callan he is out scavenging he's he is somebody who is more independent than maybe other people around perceive him to be um, yes, so, yeah. so doyle is more companion as opposed to an outright an assistance um dog um, exactly yeah. yeah and i think with um haki bamber as well um there's the great bit when um you you know callan is unable to perceive a threat but doyle does and uh, yes. the, and if it, it was a bit like um i know it's the obvious reference but um doug from up 
when yes it's, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. You, you go out of mate mode and into dog mode uh, that's it yeah yeah i thought yeah. that that was terrific in in the set as well uh, so what was it like working with like harky as well for that relationship i imagine he wasn't super method with it but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's it's a different type of rapport that you've got to have with an actor isn't it it is. I think what helped was when we recorded it at that time, Big Finish was still operating a policy because we were still sort of in the height of the pandemic, really. So not every actor in the set was allowed to be in studio on the recording day. So it was only myself, uh, Christopher Eccleston, Harkey, and then Michael, who, as you said, like, you know, plays Bram and some of side characters as well. So we were the only ones there on the day. And I think the fact that for me and Harkey, it was our first Big Finishes for like both of us. I think that helped sort of, you know, get a good rapport to start with because then you've got you've got common ground to work with. And we're both, you know, originally anyway, we're both Yorkshire lads, you know, <laughs> so it's a, that's always a good bond. And um, yeah, it was actually fun exploring it because, you know, quite rightly, he says at the start, you know, it was like, how am I going to bring life to a dog? You know, it's so <laughs> it's so different. But um, if so quickly, that sort of, you know, energetic, curious and I felt it, like even when we did it in studio, it never felt like a, you know, like a parody or a send up. He did it with like the utmost serious mm. as any good actor should. You know, he, t he approached it serious and it, it came across really well in studio and hearing it back on audio. Obviously, they've put some like voice effects on it and stuff, um, but it sounds great. And again, it just for me sounds like those if you didn't have the sound effects of like a dog panting or mm. running or barking, I'd honestly think it was just, you know, two mates, two humans talking. But yeah, Harky was phenomenal to work with. I just, I admired his speed with it all, you know, how quickly he just sort of, you know, assimilated into into that character, really. Yeah, and it wasn't, um, so it wasn't just Harky you were with in studio, it was Michael and also Christopher Eccleston as well. And, yes, and, yeah. And, and uh, in this story, I think Callan, without going into spoilers or specifics, he goes through the ringer emotionally in, in the story. <laughs> it really does, I wasn't kind of expecting... Um, expecting that from you, I thought you did terrific, of course. But I it was oh, like, thank you. This, this is Adam who talks to me about Doctor Who viewing figures. I don't, <laughs> I don't like seeing. I don't like hearing him yeah. sad. That's not. So, so we're like being. I've, a, had, so I've like, had a few people say that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, and so and so I can imagine. It's it's a it is a job. It, you are acting professionally yes. in that capacity, yeah. but like being mm. like going through those motions in front of someone like Eccleston. I can, yes, I can yeah. imagine that uh, would have been a very surreal experience working with him. It was. And I think when I read the script, because, of course, in the world of audio drama, you don't necessarily you don't have to learn the script off by heart. You know, it's not as the same as when you're doing it in the theatre. Um, I had read it a couple of times, but I remember the night before I was staying in London and I, you know, I reread it in my hotel room. And, you know, those scenes, as you say, in particular, I thought, right, this is going to this is going to require a lot from me as an actor to bring to this and i sort of told myself then i was like you know regardless of who's there or what you know what's going on like you said it's a job and you've just you've got to do what the job requires regardless whether you know doctor who's standing next to you or whoever's <laughs> watching in the control room so when it came to it and i think because we recorded it in you know in story order we went from beginning to end and i think that helped tremendously because by the time we got to those points you know, you sort of feel like you're fully in it then, you know, you, you feel like you're experiencing what these characters are experiencing. And I mean, Chris, Chris was perfect in those moments, you know, where the doctor's supporting Callan mm -hmm. or trying to like rationale with him. I think his, his reaction to my delivery and vice versa just was, it felt so natural. None of it felt forced because any actor will tell you doing heightened emotions like that, it's not easy or not easy to do like convincingly, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like it's easy to say, you know, I'm angry or I'm really sad. But, you know, if you do, that's not believable, is it? <laughs> but so to do it naturalistically is something else. And um, yeah, we, it, we just sort of did it. We went for it. We did, I think, two or three takes of it. And um, and that was that, really. So, yeah, I think it might just sound like a very lazy answer, but it's true. I, I guess I sort of psyched myself in the right frame of mind for it so that when it came to it, I wasn't worried about how will this come across? It was like, right, this is the these are the lines. These are the emotions I need to reach. Let's try and reach him sort of thing. Yeah, I, I can imagine it was also a lot easier being there in London and recording it, being able to yes. catch the light of your, your fellow actors' eyes uh, as well during it, it was because, I mean, some of the other actors in the story who were all brilliant, you know, obviously they were doing it over Zoom and it still sounded great. But as you, as you know, you know, any technical thing can happen. <laughs> you know, you hear the sound of something outside or 
or the zoom line goes dead you know what it's like so yeah being able to go to the studio and do it for real is is an absolute must absolutely yeah i can imagine uh, a big help would have been having the brilliant helen goldwyn in your ears as well oh like, yeah she's, she's like a big finish directorial heavy hitter like she's basically when you've got a big box set or a big names attached you bring in helen i've got so much honestly i've got so much admiration and respect for helen because I, I, she's done it all really because i think she she you know acted in some big finish plays uh in in the early days and she's moved to directing as you say and uh, or like writing stories and all that sort of stuff but she absolutely gives 110 percent. i mean as a director i've worked with some i won't name names but i've, I've worked with some awful director i think any actor does do you know what i mean mm -hmm. you, you you very quickly learn what a good director is as opposed to a bad director and um helen's phenomenal because obviously we only had the one day to record it and you think oh it's you know it's a 50 minute story or whatever that you know you should be able to knock that out in half a day but of course you do it you you you're doing multiple takes or you, something might go wrong or whatever but helen is exactly the kind of director you need in that situation she's decisive mm -hmm. and she knows what she wants to hear so if i did a take and she goes adam can you i think there's one scene you know where callan's this isn't really spoilery but callan's in his bedroom at one point sort of sulking mm -hmm. you know he's, he's annoyed that he's basically been told by his mum to go to his room for, for being out um you know so i did the first take and she went adam that you know good stuff just do it again but be more be more like that sort of you know teenage sulkishness you know what it's like <laughs> where you're getting in a funk about you're making it a big deal when it's not really a big deal sort of thing so yeah, but, but that's what I like. I'd rather, I know some directors say, oh, I don't like telling actors that, that I want them to do this. It's like, well, that's what a director needs to be in my view. You know, if you want to see a certain thing, it's the job of the actor to try and deliver that. So yeah, she was the perfect director. So um, if you could, uh, it'd be great to hear about um, uh, how you sort of resonated with uh, Roy Gill's script with the character of Callum because of the aspect of him being partially sighted. Like, because it's yes. um, it's not a hindrance to the character, and it's in fact a, a no. strength going up against the, the titular Red Darkness. But uh, I imagine that, yeah. um, obviously, you'll know better than me, but uh, what I, I imagine there's not that many um, acting jobs that you've done which have utilised that part of yourself. Uh, no, there there was, ironically, in the last few years, there has been more and more, um, I think it's a good example of, you know, they're saying that the acting industry is trying to diversify um, in, in all kinds of ways, you know, whether that's how you look or what abilities you have. Um, I was actually meant to do a musical right before the pandemic called No Horizon, uh, which was telling the real life story of a guy called Nicholas Saunderson, who in the 1600s, 1700s, a real tr true story, was a Yorkshire lad, blind from the age of one. Uh, but ultimately, he ended up becoming the uh, Lucasian Professor of Maths at Cambridge, Cambridge Uni, because um, he was so gifted with mathematics. But that required, you know, someone with a uh, visual impairment. So I think it is it is happening more. But um, yeah, ha having to do it for audio is is different because obviously on stage you try, you know, you're portraying visual impairment visually. On audio, it's different. I try not to think about it too much because I think the script. Roy wrote it brilliantly where the moments where it needed to be emphasized or, you know, explained or whatever, it was all there in the script. Um, it, it didn't sort of require me every two seconds going, oh, by the way, I can't I can't see this or this is tricky. Mm. Um, but no, it felt really easy to relate to because, again, as mentioned, the, the challenges that Callum faces or people saying you shouldn't be doing this because of your eyes or whatever, I relate to that 100 percent. And again, for me and in a lot of cases for Callan, it is it is done with good intentions from people but i think it is also it can be a bit much especially on a teenager so yeah relating to it was relating to it felt really easy yeah i, I think uh how roy girl handled the character writing wise as well on the page like it becomes oh, an yeah. it becomes an extension of um parents sort of like needing to maybe loosen up um, with their with their kids or loosen up with their family um yeah because I, I think Callan's such a, a very textured character like that like you're basically in every scene like more or less like 90 <laughs> like uh, you should yeah like, yeah you, that was pressurizing reading the script but say, i was like oh i'm in this scene oh i'm in that scene as well so. <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, but uh it, it was a terrific listen and i, I thought you did a, a terrific job um throughout the story uh so it gives oh, thank you massive congratulations 
months. And uh, but I'd like to ask what uh, what you're up to in the near future. Now I understand that like you've got a, a play with uh, with your partner Rebecca, yes, uh, which yeah. I, I had the pleasure of seeing uh, when you performed in Salford a few months back. Uh, called certainly P- did. Yeah, it's called Pill. But I'd love to um, hear about it from you if that's possible, and when you're next performing it. Of course. So uh, Pill is a autobiographical play that my partner Rebecca has written. Uh, it's about her real life experience with the contraceptive pill. And, um, you know, she got told, as many girls are when they're teenagers or young adults, you know, it basically, well, we when we were in school, it wasn't we, it wasn't a very detailed explanation. You know, it was very much just like, oh, if you don't want children, then you better take the contraceptive pill. And that was it. But what a lot of people don't know, uh, men and women and everyone alike, especially at that age, is that th- there can be some horrendous side effects to taking it, you know, in terms of what happens to your hormones, what happens to your mood, uh, your life really can change dramatically. So it's a short play chronicling that experience. I play uh, the doctor in it, not the, d- no, not that doctor, everyone, stop it, not that doctor, <laughs> just a doctor who's based off doctors that my partner has met, you know, over the years. And um, every time she goes to them and says, this is getting worse, like I'm feeling all all these bad things, they just say, oh, right, OK, well, we'll just give you a variation of the same thing. And it, I, I won't I won't spoil too much of it. But basically, yeah, it's a play about the day. Da- well, yeah, the dangers or side effects of the contraceptive pill and just making everyone more aware of it, I suppose. it's. I think it's quite an important topic for young people, really. I mean, I'd hope that education on this subject is better nowadays than it was when I was in school. But I don't know. And uh, we don't have any uh, performances of it scheduled yet. But I know Rebecca's trying to eventually get it into like, you know, six forms and stuff like that. Because mm. I think for, you know, 17, 18 year olds, it's a crucial thing for them to learn. But yeah, if we do any more public performances, if you keep an eye on my uh, Twitter, Adam Martin AMTV, I'm sure I'll be posting about it there sometime. Yeah, because like I said, I got to see it and I thought it was a, a terrifically disarming play. Like it, it's not um, mm. it's not anti-contraceptive pill. It's more like pro-knowledge no, and pro-information that um, is often not talked about with what could be considered a, t- a taboo topic, especially how like, I don't know, uh, I can let me know if this is a spoiler, but at, oh, right. the, at the end, you had a chat about it with the audience, which I was not expecting about yes, like, about yeah. what, what we'd just watched. And I thought that, that's, yeah. that's why I called it a disarming play, because, mm. uh, yeah, it was just a really, a really interesting performance. I, yeah, I really enjoyed it when I saw it. Darren, thank you for coming to see it. And I think, like you're saying, having that chat is so enlightening, though, because a lot of the performances we've done when we've done it, uh, a lot of the men in the audience, you know, go, oh, I didn't know... I didn't know this could happen sort of thing. Cause I don't think it's told to boys in the same way that it's told to girls, but I think even girls don't get the full, like you say, the full, it's awareness. It's not anti-contraceptive. It's awareness. It's just, we need to make people aware of all the different things that can happen. And, uh, you know, for some people who take the pill, there's no effect whatsoever. You know, there's no side effect. It's exactly what it's meant to do, but for others, it's not that, but then it's like, if that happens, how can we help, you know, how can we assist those around us who are going through that? So yeah, that's the idea of Pill. So yeah, keep an eye on the social medias. Go and follow Blue Balloon Theatre. That's my partner's a uh, theatre company, and that's what Pill is uh, performed under. So if you give that a follow, then you'll you'll be up to date. Yeah, terrific stuff. And uh, so Adam, what what have you got uh, lined up in the near future? I know you've still got your YouTube stuff, but uh, oh, I'd yes. love, love to hear what else you're up to. So the 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 eternal actor's question. So <laughs> what's next? Uh, well, I'm always, as any actor will tell you, I'm always applying for things. You know, all sorts, theatre, uh, audio stuff, stage. Uh, I just said stage. You know what I mean? Everything. Mm-hmm. Applying for everything. Uh, doing a lot of YouTube stuff at the minute, focusing on like some of my real life jobs, if you like, because trying to eventually buy a house, folks. But I tell you what, have you looked at the housing market? It's not cheap. So, yeah, uh, just mainly focusing on that. And sometimes you have to, don't you? You've got to focus on building up some stuff. But, yeah, who? Um, that I can't really... I haven't got anything more concrete than that, I'm afraid, at the moment. But, yeah, I'm always applying, always looking for stuff. So if anyone out there is a theatre producer, director, whatever, <laughs> or has any has any jobs filling, you know, just shoot me a message. I'm, I'm available. I can send you what I've got, but... Yeah, that that's it. Yes, I'm not sure if I trust you after the last time I saw you and you were. Keeping... People keep saying this. They're like, "Well, we're not going to listen to anything you say now." Uh, I'm, I'm, expe- like... and I'm expecting like four or five months time. It's going to be like you're the Jodie Whittaker's joining Big Finish, and you're the new companion. Oh, a, a Balan Menex would, or something. I would, ad- I would adore that. I would adore that. <laughs> but before we round off on it, I've got to say, I've had you know, I've had a lot of lovely comments saying you know I'd love to see 
Callan back and stuff. And, you know, you know as much as me at the minute. Hmm. I I said when I finished that recording, I was like, you know, if, if, if you want me to do more, I'll do more. But, you know, you know what it's like. Could be could be here, could be there, could be everywhere. But I would love to say um, there can't be a Callum without Doyle. Mm. Like Callum and Doyle, like I said, they're, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. So I know I don't think I'd want to do Callum on his own. I'd, I'd, I, thinking about it, I've got to have got to have my partner in crime by my mm. side. So, yeah, but, you know, we'll, we'll just see in the future if, if Big Finish want to do more and uh, then I'll 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 happily do more. No, wonderful stuff. Uh, and we'll cap this off with one very cliche last question. How was the lunch? Well, I'm afraid. Well, I've got I've got to let you in on a on a little secret here. Oh no! Uh, the the big finish lunch isn't a thing anymore. No Lancashire hot pot. No. no. Well, you see, I I only found out about this. It didn't happen on the day. And at first I thought, oh, maybe, you know, it, it's just like a day where they don't do it or whatever. But I actually saw, you know, in Vortex, the big Finnish magazine, mm. I was reading uh, one of them a few months. It was it was the other month. And in the question section, someone asked about the lunches. And Nick Briggs said the pandemic basically put an end to that because where I think before the pandemic, they were at a different recording studio mm. where they had the facilities to do it. And where I recorded is somewhere different. So it's all it's all takeaways now. So a lovely, lovely staff members go out to pret a manger or wherever's near and they bring in and they bring and they brought in lunch. So, yeah, sadly, the the famous big finished lunches aren't. Uh, I mean, the lunch was lovely. The lunch we had was lovely. <laughs> yeah. Don't get me wrong. But the the famous big finished lunches that all the actors talk about is uh, sadly not a thing anymore. Yeah, but yeah, that does make sense. So this was late 2021. It was still a bit. It was uh, a bit touch and go. But it, it just shows how long this has been um, in the in the <laughs> in the books for how long this has been um, coming. And I appreciate I, I appreciate your time chatting about uh, Red Darkness. No, no. And again, thank you for asking me. It's always a pleasure to, always a pleasure to be on the Mister Tardis channel. Yeah, great stuff. If you wanted to, to plug anything else, of course, Red Darkness and part of the Shades of Fear box that is available now from BigFinish.com. But if you've got any right. other links or anything that you wanted to throw away, now's now's your time. Sure. So uh, as I said, you can follow us on Twitter at Adam Martin AMTV. You can keep up with my daily ramblings, like when new videos are out, any acting jobs, etc., etc. So you can follow us there. On YouTube, my main channel is Adam Martin, just my name. Um, but I have a specific Doctor Who theme YouTube channel now as well called AMTV Who. Starting that up, uh, trying to make videos for that when I can. And um, yeah, those are the main things to plug, I suppose. And uh, yeah, just um, again, if anyone's got any acting work, you know where to find me, please. So, uh, but yes, no, that that's everything, I think. Yeah, wonderful stuff. Sorry, Theo just decided to jump on my lap and knock my headphones out. Oh. I'm, sure you sound, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you sounded great, though, Adam. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you so much for your time. It's been a great, it's been great chatting with you. Thank you. No, Andrew, thank you very much.